I had spent so much time blaming him or blaming myself and not enough time understanding that there was just two people involved in this and again, co-creating a dynamic. What destroys relationships faster than anything else and the most out of anything else is stress. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Mark Groves Podcast. Today, I am excited to have the relationship coach and teacher, Jillian Tarecki. Welcome. Hi. I'm so glad to be here. Oh my gosh, I'm so happy to finally get you on the podcast because I've been uh, observing and watching and learning from your many teaching reels and your posts and your writing. And uh, it's been really just beautiful to be a witness and, and to be able to, to learn from you. So thank you for all the work you've been doing. Thank you. Thank you. Right back at you, Mark. Well, I'm curious, what led to you moving into this space of teaching relationship? I was a yoga teacher for many years, close to 20 years. So I've always been incredibly drawn to and captivated by and fascinated by the relationship between the mind and the body, particularly one's emotions and how Mm -hmm. it comes out in the body and how to use our bodies in a very specific way to create more internal balance, basically. In teaching yoga, I've worked with people, a lot of people in their injuries. Um, That was sort of like my thing. You know, when you work intimately with someone in their body, you start to learn a lot about their relationships, their marriages and whatnot. I never really gave advice, but it was just interesting that it would always come to me. A few years into teaching yoga, I felt like I loved teaching, but I felt like something was missing. I felt like there was something more that I was supposed to be doing. I just didn't know what that was. Like I literally had no idea because the teaching yoga ceiling is pretty low and I would find myself bumping my head against that ceiling a lot. But I also had this very strong desire to be married and to have kids and to go that route. So I did. I ended up meeting uh, my now ex-husband many years ago and uh, got married. I thought that when I met him, I was mature, done the work. I'm a yogi. Like I, I study the mind. I study, I study the body. I, I meditate. But I had very little, I mean, I don't know, I should say, it's all relative, the amount of skills one's ha- one has in a relationship. But I didn't have, like when I compare myself to, na- to where I am now, it's kind of, un- it's kind of unbelievable. <laughs> I know that feeling. Very well. So I, um, the relationship, we were together for about a year and three quarters before actually getting married. And the relationship before we were married was I've always described it was like 90% on point, but the 10% was very significant. It wasn't like the 10% of, oh, we have like these issues that we need to work out. The 10% was the reason why we ended up splitting. And there were red flags. I mean, I know that's an incredibly overused term, but there was some red flags where that were very, very major upon, you know, reflection. The nature of those flags really pointed more to my not being able to ask for what I need inside of a relationship because of my pathological fear of the relationship not working out. So we got married and it was pretty much tumultuous for the two years that we were married. It was very, very painful. It was a classic example of, I historically, I've healed so much of this, but I've historically had a very troubling relationship with my father who, with his own mental health issues, would shut down and pull away. And I never, I never knew what kind of mood he would be in. So I grew up I was the daughter that was more sensitive, so I grew up with a level of hypervigilance around men and their moods, because this Mm. wouldn't really happen in friendships. Turns out I marry someone who is on the surface and personality-wise couldn't be any more different from my father, but he had undiagnosed bipolar stuff, and, and his 
of he had a void serious avoidant and shut down issues and that would be like that would trigger me to the core and so we were playing that out and as anyone who is pathologically afraid of a, of being abandoned of the relationship ending you know i didn't actually i mean there would be times where i would get angry it's not like i was just like this useless doormat all the time but i wouldn't actually ever express on a deep level this needs to change or else i'm out you know ultimatum style yeah and so it was just a mess and when that ended and i've you know i've healed really all of this this does not this is not a trauma that lives inside of me at all anymore but it ended really lame it was over the phone and my mother before it ended was diagnosed with stage 4 lung cancer and you don't survive that so i had my mother dying i was having a miscarriage and then he was like peace i'm out so that day that that all happened i was wow. like hmm this is what it's like for your life to fall apart it was surreal yeah i was like my life this is my life falling apart i do not mean to romanticize growth or change because it's just not something that should be romanticized it's usually very dirty and messy and ugly but that really was the day it was like the day it was the the day I died, there was the death of Jillian as I knew her and then a sort of rebirth. And I, I couldn't believe it because I also had all this, this conditioning weighing on my shoulders because I was 40 and now I wasn't, you know, I wasn't going to have the opportunity to have a child and my husband was leaving me who would ever want me, which is like for anyone listening, that's like turned out to be like the funniest thing ever because nothing could be further from the <laughs> truth. But I really, I felt that and I could not fucking believe that this was happening. I could not believe, I was like, why can't I get this relationship thing right? You know, and for me, right meant lasting because mm -hmm. I've had some really lovely, beautiful relationships. So I became obsessed and I've always been sort of obsessed about what makes a relationship works, but now I got really obsessed. and. I guess in trying to cope with the grief of losing my marriage, my mom dying, and then eventually she did die, I just put all my energy into this new form of co you know, coaching. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think that's really what motivated me is that I had to put my energy into something so that I could stay afloat, so that I could actually get my ass out of bed in the morning. I never would kill myself. I would never consider myself suicidal, but I think there are moments where we, where many of us will say to ourselves, I wish I would die, you know? Mm -hmm. So I guess it's suicidal ideation. I mean, I literally was like, I don't know how I'm going to make it. Even though I knew that I, deep down I knew I would, I just didn't know how. Mm -hmm. um, and so I put all my energy into figuring this out. I've always been very lucky to, teachers have always come into my life at the right time. Like, you know, for yoga, I've had a lot of mentors and teachers and people who I've learned from. And I had my friend who lived in the building because um, I'm from New York City. I was living in Brooklyn and it was, sun it was June. So I was outside with my dog and it was a beautiful, I was able to just like be outside. Otherwise I'd probably never leave my apartment, never leave my bed. And she found me and she happened to be a coach. And this is years ago. So this was, I was not, I was very much in the wellness yoga world, the coaching personal development world. I was not as, it's crazy because I feel so part of it now, which is both fun and embarrassing all at once. But I, <laughs> I, I was not familiar with that, but she was a coach and she was like one of like the first that I have known of. And she sat down and She's like, you're really going through it, aren't you? And I said, yes. And I told her everything that was happening. And she's so, what makes her brilliant as a coach is that she's such a good listener. And she's like, you know, you should really listen to some Tony Robbins videos. I was like, the infomercial dude? Like I had no, I was so just not in that <laughs> yeah. world. And I'm, I'm sort of skeptic by nature. And I was like, I'm going to hate him. And she's like, I, I don't think you are. I think he's, I think it's going to resonate. And she sent me some stuff that 
back then there you couldn't find on YouTube and it's because she done something, went to some sort of seminar. So she had access to something. And then she's like, just watch. And I said, okay, well, I have nothing to lose. And she sent me these three hour long videos and I watched them all that night and something clicked for me and the rest is history. <laughs> I love that. I would remember hearing um, Martha Beck say that when you're like surrender or exhale to what you need or to a teacher, they show up and they come in the weirdest, oddest, <laughs> come in the infomercial totally. guy with the giant hands, yeah. <laughs> you know? And I, you know, I, I have a, not the same origin story, but similar in that I had a relation, an engagement end and I was in sales and I was so obsessed with understanding how to manipulate humans and get them to change their behavior. I was in pharma and then I had a relationship end and all of a sudden I just had this like insatiable desire to understand why I wasn't good at romantic relationships, but I could do all these other things. I could communicate with people. I could build rapport in seconds. I could sell things, but I couldn't actually have a partner feel heard, understood, safe, and do it for myself too. And it led me to being obsessed with wanting to understand it. And one of the first videos I remember consuming was Tony Robbins' TED Talk, uh, which I think is called Why People Do What They Do. And it was just so, again, you know, you start to put all these pieces together of seeing yourself through a different lens. And I'm curious, based on your experience in yoga, which of course yoga has a lot of self-reflection. I know they say that Shavasana is the hardest pose, which I would, or I don't actually believe that. I'm like, that's a great pose, you just nap at the end. <laughs> but I'm curious, what was different in the awarenesses, like why do you think you missed or didn't see the need for the skills in that 10% that you're talking about, that you and, and your ex-husband, that 10% which really becomes the 90%, you know, of how we operate. Yes. So yeah, I'm curious why you might have missed that. And then once you saw it, <laughs> what flipped or, or what was your mission after that? Because in the practice of yoga, all forms of yoga, and I practice mostly yoga asana, so like the postures, the focus is understanding the nature of your mind and disciplining the mind to create change in the body. So it's very much the relationship that you have with yourself, which is really foundational mm -hmm. to what it is that I teach, but it doesn't really, it doesn't teach you communication skills. Yeah, that's true. It can certainly help to build self-esteem, definitely helps to build tremendous self-awareness. There was just always more, I guess, for me to do, to contemplate, to really understand myself. And I, I think that you have to understand not just how the mind works, right? Because that's the study of yoga is understanding like the mind, the monkey mind, the rumination, the, the way the mind creates stories and fiction. I think that's why I got so into coaching is because I had already been studying that in some way, but the language, mm -hmm. the verbiage used to describe it was very different. But you also have to understand your own personal psychology, like what makes you tick, and you have to understand the psychology of the other. So I guess I was always really fascinated with psychology, but my father being a psychiatrist, I never really wanted to go that route. Mm. So like the irony here is like... <laughs> it's never um, lost upon us in hindsight, it's right? Never, like, I mean, the apple just does not fall too far from the fucking tree. Isn't that so true? It's like we try so hard to never be like our parents or be in relationship with people like our parents. And then, you know, inevitably we end up... It just uh, happens. You know, as uh, in Getting the Love You Want, as Harville Hendricks and Helen Hunt talk about, like we unconsciously merge with a lover who mirrors the pain and the things that we go through, the frustrations yes. of our, our parent. To follow up on your your answer about yoga, in my experience with yoga too, because I kind of found it at the same time, you know, which I think inevitably you <laughs> you find these spiritual practices or practices that expand the space between moments. Like that, I was always someone who spent so much of my time being busy, like had FOMO, always had to be out, be with other people which I would have called myself gregarious and extroverted, but really was a compensatory strategy to not have to be with myself. You know, I didn't know how to self-regulate. And yoga was at least really pushing me into that. There was so much silence and so much 
I think like my experience of even though that broadened moments or or turned a second into two seconds in my reactivity, I guess yoga is really about a practice with the self. And that might give you a few extra pieces in your toolbox, but it's still not relationship with other. And that's really where where it all <laughs> either comes crashing down or rising up. And it usually has to crash to rise. So I think it always has to crash to rise. Always has to crash to rise. Yeah. I mean, I, I will say that my background in teaching yoga has been very useful um, for my coaching career um, and just my methodology or how I see, how I look at things and self-awareness and your relationship to yourself is really most important. But it's not going to talk about your self-esteem issues when like your daddy issues come up with someone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like Shavasana is not bringing up your dad stuff. Well, maybe sometimes. Exactly. But. but it does provide a space into which one can say, oh, I'm feeling all this tension in my body right now. Something must be wrong. Mm. And I think that's that level of somatic awareness. I knew things were wrong. I felt it in my body. I could identify it. I was just too afraid to face it and had no idea how to face it. Again, it was just about keeping the relationship intact. We need to talk about my morning routine. I'm nailing it. I got meditation, breath work, some cool plunging, workouts. And, you know, most of you have probably tried meditation. I'm guessing for some of you, it is part of your morning ritual. But have you tried breath work? That's my question. I took a class on an app that I'm just loving and I'm hooked on it. The app is unbelievable and it's called Open. I had the founder, Minaj Diaz, on the podcast a few times because he's an incredible teacher and he really lives everything that he shares. And the app is incredible. The design is insane. Some of the benefits that I've really experienced from implementing this in my morning routine is I sleep better, I'm less stressed, and I have more energy and focus throughout the day. And the best part about Open is that the classes are under 10 minutes. So it's easy to stick with. It's not like an overwhelming thing. It's actually quite simple. And so usually what I'll do is a meditation, breath work, and then they also have movement classes. So it's easy to just have consistent morning routines because you can go to one place and it's just that much easier. It's definitely different from other mindfulness apps out there and you're definitely going to know what I mean when you try it. You get 30 days for free when you sign up with my code create the love. So you just visit withopen.com slash create the love. So again, you get 30 days free, so you got no risk on open, and you just go to with open, W I T H O P E N dot com slash create the love. Go check it out. So, previously, when I traveled a lot for work, I always needed consistent internet, a consistent workspace. I like to have coffee on tap. And so I became a WeWork member years and years ago. And recently, because I found myself living in Las Vegas, I wanted a place I could go to all the time. So I got an office at WeWork. And that's where I'm recording this current podcast. I mean, that's where I work from. And WeWork also has a thing called On Demand, and it lets you access nearby workspaces by the day, and you can do meeting rooms by the hour. All you got to do is download the WeWork app, find the closest location, and you just head over. You'll always have a workspace at your fingertips, and you can choose from literally hundreds of locations around the world. And what I love about that is no matter where I go, I know what I'm getting. So it starts at 29 bucks. You can get a workspace, as I said, unlimited coffee. They also have tea, free Wi-Fi, access to phone booths, lounge areas, networking events. And I just absolutely love the environment. The people who work at WeWork are incredible humans too. So I chatted with them and I was like, hey, hook my people up so they could try it out. You get 50% off your first workplace booking with WeWork On Demand. Just go to we.co, so we.co slash mark and use the promo code workwithmark. So that's we.co slash mark and the promo code workwithmark for 50% off your first workplace booking. See you there. Before we hit record, we were talking about how, like if you're afraid that the relationship is gonna end, then inevitably anything that might lead to its ending. So any relationship conversations that are challenging, that bring forth the truth of what's going on in the ether of ourselves and the ether of the connection. If we're terrified of being left or abandoned, we usually won't express those things 
because keeping the relationship together and not feeling rejected or abandoned actually is prioritized, which yes, then we end up feeling like totally unseen, unwitnessed, unloved in our relationships. And it's there's a level of loneliness that we don't, I think, correlate when we're around other people. But I don't know that there's anything more lonely than being with people, but not able to be with yourself. You know what I mean? Like there's almost like a disassociation required. Oh, it's the worst. It's the when you're sleeping in bed with someone and you feel more alone than you've ever felt before. I mean, yeah. that is worse than when you're you, the loneliness of missing a warm body next to you. It's it's really the worst. And the thing is, you one does not need to have attachment issues, anxiety issues, all the quote unquote diagnoses of the current pop psychology zeitgeist. You do not have to have those things to experience that level of pain and loneliness when you're in a relationship with someone. And let's say it's not working. I mean, everyone is terrified that they're not going to be loved and they're not going to be enough. I mean, that's not a pathology. That's part of being human. Mm, And yes, there's, yeah. And there are some people who obviously fear it more than others, but if you are in a relationship with someone who you love and you're starting to sense that they're pulling away or they're whatever, they're going through something that's unrelated, they're not able to show up in the relationship, that's going to create anxiety and fear in anyone. What we do with that fear is the needle mover. Most people, myself included in the past, would it's all unconscious, will manipulate, yeah. right? Like, well, how can I strategize to get this person to be more <laughs> engaged with me? Like, what can I do? Maybe I'll pull away a little too, because there's always that dance. There's always that unconscious dance. I mean, Ram Das speaks about this a lot. It's like one person comes in, the other person comes in, then maybe the other person pulls away a little bit, not necessarily about because of avoidance, but maybe because what's over there their work, their family, something's pulling them in that direction. And then the other person will come in, lean in a little bit. So there's always like, there's this space between two people. And I think that the ideal is to create, it's almost like this vibration where the two people are kind of like coming in and going apart and coming in and going apart it gets so messy when it's so one-sided. It's one person always going like this, the other person always coming in. And then the, the, the mess, the real mess is when, and this is the unconscious manipulation, they're pulling away. Okay. I've been chasing. I've been leaning in. I've been chasing. That's not working. I'm in fight or flight right now. So I'm going to shut down and pull away because that's going to bring them closer. And then all of a sudden the other person's like, what? I might lose them. Mm-hmm. And then they come in and then they, they, they switch roles, right? You know, it's not fixed. So, so all of a sudden the, the, the quote unquote avoidant becomes the pursuer and the, the pursuer is the avoidant. And these are two people terrified that they're not enough, terrified that they're going to lose love from each other, manipulating the hell out of each other. And that's the toxicity that can erupt in an otherwise seemingly normal relationship. That's like the dance of so many. I'm sure for the people listening, they're like, fuck, that's exactly what happened with that guy on Bumble or, you know, or even in our long term relationships. I find what's interesting about sort of the therapeutic psychology space that for so many reasons has erupted on social media. And I would say, you know, it's what you said about normalizing the experience of anxiety or pain or suffering when you're in relational dances that are not safe, are not psychologically safe, are not emotionally safe. And we're co-creating those things, you know? And I think when we look at the level of anxiety in our world today, and then we go, well, if it's normal to have anxiety, then what's wrong with what's going on in our world or how we're relating? Like, what is causing this? And that really is the question. I think, you know, one of the real pivotal moments in Kylie and I's relationship was when she had an, you know, a fear about something and she came to me about it. And I said to her, I remember it was just like such a switching moment because she was like, 
it was that I was going to pay for a flight for her to come um, when we were coming back together. And she said, I just feel like kind of off about you paying. And I was like, okay. And she's like, what is wrong with me that I can't receive from you? And I was like, hold up. <laughs> Cause when I had offered to pay, I had this like little golem shadow version of me who's like, oh, if you pay, then she owes you like you've got her. Mm. But it was more in like a, if he pays, then, you know, it was more in that type <laughs> of voice because it's not an essential way that I would want to relate, mm -hmm. but it's a hook. It's like a power dynamic. It's a codependent hook. And mm -hmm. I remember saying to her, which I really believe that when you take these things that implicitly exist, because sometimes you are going to pay for stuff and the other person is, and you know, you have different ways that you show up depending on life circumstances is to take what's implicit and make it explicit. And then it removes the power of the hook. And I said to her like, well, what happens if actually your intuitive feeling is not a problem with you, but actually an incredible piece of wisdom that you're picking up in the fucking fifth or seventh dimension that you're dancing in with my shadow and and you're actually these are the conversations right. you two have that's very impressive <laughs> well it was <laughs> that's like was that's pretty. like next level impressive <laughs> of like self-awareness i felt really ashamed to admit that that voice existed mm -hmm. but when i said that to her it was this complete different orientation of her towards her own intuition that had often been gaslit or society teaches people not to explore and then it shows up as anxiety or it shows up as depression and it was just this moment of change because I felt seen, even though I didn't like what I saw. And she felt validated that she wasn't crazy or there wasn't some. And that was really a change in our relational pattern where she felt like she couldn't show up to love. And I felt like she wasn't showing up. And that was the constant cycle we were in. And then all of a sudden there was this, and that's why we broke up. But when we came back together, it was in this different way. And I think that that experience of anxiety is just like so you were talking about you know we we diagnose these things and in the diagnosis of these things you know we were talking just briefly about it before we hit record is that diagnoses often end up like you said that we end up in a box and we end up in a prison as opposed to like what is incredibly brilliant about me that I feel this way or I understand, you know, whatever it might be. So I'm curious your thoughts on all that. Yeah. Well, did you end up paying for the flight? <laughs> I think I did, but it didn't have a hook anymore. Yeah, it, exactly. It didn't have the hook. So then it's like, yeah, of course I want to, of course I want to pay for you. Like, this is my gift. This is what I want to do for you. Like, I want to take care of you. I want you to feel taken care of. Once it's like out in the open, it doesn't feel so shadowy and weird. So that's very impressive. With anxiety, there's just no doubt that there are people, myself included in the past, if you're feeling really anxious, like I said, you go into control and then you start to like nitpick. And at the end of the day, if that's happening to you a lot and you're feeling super anxious all the time in your relationship and it's not just your relationship, but this is a pattern, you're always feeling anxious. You have to look at your level of self-worth and your whatever, your abandonment wound, I put that in quotation marks, whatever, however you want to refer to it as. So it's not that having anxiety in a relationship isn't, yeah, sometimes it's, it's normal. If you're in a relationship, your lover is pulling away, you're going to feel anxious. If, yeah. if in some way you don't feel good enough, like you're going to feel anxious. If two people are not being consistent with each other. They're not meeting their each other's needs for certainty. They're not meeting each other's needs to feel loved and to feel important. Feeling anxious and worried is a normal reaction. That is also different than someone who struggles with their sense of worth I mean, their lover like looks away for a second and they're like, what does that mean? You don't yeah, like me anymore. Yeah. <laughs> What's going to happen? So that level of hypervigilance and anxiety is something that is a problem, right? You do yeah. want to look at that because what that does is that it turns the other person off and they're just going to yeah. be like, I can never like, make bye. you happy. I can't even yeah. be myself. It's a nightmare. 
the problem that I see with so many people saying I have anxious attachment or, or pathologizing others, they're avoidant. Maybe they are. I don't know until I actually speak to someone and know the situation. But there have been times where people have said to me, I'm in a relationship with an avoidant. And after some digging and actually meeting that person, it's like, mm, no, they're just, they've just been worn down by the relationship or they feel just totally misunderstood. But there's this attitude these days of, well, they're just avoidant, so they're messed up and they're a nightmare. And so, yeah, I, I wouldn't recommend, certainly for me, being in a relationship with avoidant is a very, not a good mix. I need to be with a securely attached person. And, you know, so if I notice anything avoidant, the difference now in me versus the older version of me is like, I have absolutely no problem walking away from that. But in the past, I would have been working very hard to prove myself, my worthiness, and to try to earn love. But, and I know, I feel like I'm going a little bit in circles here, but this is what's really important to know. Stop telling, you know, just saying just because they're not as communicative of you as you that they're avoidant. If they're pulling away, maybe there is something going on that is making them pull away. I'm not saying I'm not condoning pulling away. And what I what I want to encourage everyone is to communicate, right? So we all have our dysfunctional stuff and we're trying to make things more functional. But to just then be like, well, I'm anxious, they're avoidant. Well, maybe there's something else going on here mm. that you're not aware of that has nothing to do with or very little to do with their attachment style. There's an avoidant in everyone who's anxious. Maybe that person is shutting down because they feel like they can never make you happy. Or maybe that person is anxious because you're not present with them. You're not showing up. I would love for people to look at their situations more critically, more objectively, and then to be able to see their part in a dynamic rather than just saying, I'm anxiously attached, no one's ever going to love me, or they're always avoidant, they're a nightmare, which is the narrative that I hear a lot. And attachment styles and all these diagnoses, they're not meant to be diagnoses, they're meant to be, they're meant to expand your understanding of relationship and and who you are in a relationship but it's part of the story it's not the whole story i agree they provide a systemized way of creating a framework of how we might dance in relationship what we're prone to when we're not feeling safe not you know because you could People will then use the model of codependency or empath, you know, and, the, and narcissist, right? Like all these words that pathologize someone's behavior and even our own. Like, you know, I often will hear an empath talk about how empathic they are, but really that is permission to be boundaryless. And, Correct. And it's sort of like, but I'm just really sen- sure you're sensitive. Then you need boundaries, actually. If you're a highly sensitive person, if that doesn't come with boundaries, you're going to be fucked. And, you know, with this sort of eruption of social media psychology and, and relational awareness, which I think is so brilliant. I don't think there's ever been a moment in time that we've had more access to information that will allow us to create the type of relationships we actually desire, which the skills we inherited are old worlds. Exactly, for free. And old world skills are not going to get us new world desires. You know, like we're inheriting our parents' patterns, no fault to theirs, but we're like inheriting them because they inherited them from the grandparents and our great-grandparents were on the Oregon Trail, some of them, or in wars or in whatever. They're not thinking about like, I really need to handle my defensiveness when I come home. You know? <laughs> exactly. Like Exactly. Yeah. I find the the and I'm curious your thoughts on this, because I find the social media environment or just the psychology environment to really demonize or not give compassion to the person who tends to pull away, but gives a lot of space and solutions for the people who chase, right? Like the people who chase or who might identify as anxiously attached are like, I'm just trying to love you. And like, I show up and I show up and I show up and I listen to books and podcasts and I do all the things. And here you are watching football 
or you know, not listening to the podcast to ask you to listen to, but not actually asking the questions that you invited. Like maybe they're pulling away because they don't feel safe to be themselves. Or yeah, I'm curious your thoughts on on maybe why we yeah we do that with empaths and avoid and anxious people. I have a lot of thoughts on it. And as a sort of recovered anxious attachment person, and I did a whole workshop on this, and I really, really like helping people who are anxiously attached to get to um, take more ownership of that and change some mm-hmm. of their behavior. You know, anxiety, I think it's that anxiety. First of all, anyone who who identifies as being avoidant, they have a tremendous amount of anxiety too. It's mm-hmm. just manifesting differently physiologically. They're going more into a shutdown. The other person is not. But I think that just the word anxious inspires so much sympathy from people because we all know what it's like to feel anxious and mm-hmm. it feels absolutely awful. And I think that we all know what it feels like to be rejected and to feel abandoned. I think these are things, this is part of the human condition. And I think that it's more obvious on the outside that the person who's anxiously attached is feeling all this rejection and all this abandonment and all this anxiety. And so we tend to, we, we get that. We understand that there isn't an, a person who does not know on this planet, I don't think after a certain age, who doesn't, under, doesn't know the feeling of being rejected. So that's, that's what I think. And also, oftentimes, when we think of someone with an avoidant attachment style, we associate the silent treatment with that, stonewalling. And mm-hmm. these are things that are very much on the forefront of everyone's brain as being highly dysfunctional and borderline, if not completely emotionally abusive. Right. That's why. Though I have worked with people with what others would refer to as anxious attachment that are very, that's very severe. And the things that they have done has been on the same spectrum of emotional abuse, not allowing someone to leave the room, literally with their bodies blocking the door screaming at the quote unquote avoidant, you know, profanity. I mean, I've known people to be in such wildly dysfunctional, toxic situations. And I think what's so important for people to understand is that if you are in a situation like that, you are part of a dynamic and you have to be able to see your role in all of it. Now, that I'm not saying that this is the case someone's beating you or any something really extreme like that, but I am talking about the wild anxiety of someone being with someone who's stonewalling. There's, again, when I dig, there's always more to the story and the anxiously attached person will do things that they later say, my God, I, that was not cool of me. That was not right. So anyway, to answer your question is, I think that that's, I think people associate the avoidance with the withholding, you know, there's something so wrong with withholding love, you know, and withholding attention. It's so obvious that that is just wrong. But usually what happens in, like we said earlier in these dynamics is that the anxiously attached will then punish and do their own form of withholding love. Right. It's complicated. It is. It it's is, really it? not black or white. So I think that that's why people get, why there's more sympathy for the person who's just like, give me love, and then the avoidant who's just like, I'm just going to withhold it. When people frame it like that, there is sort of a clear victim and a clear villain, but it's very rarely the truth of the matter. Yeah, I totally agree. At least there needs to be some compassion and space for why someone's response to overwhelm is withdrawal or shutting down, or why is the energetic of the person seeking the conversation, perhaps it triggers the other person's nervous system and they're like, I got to get away. Like he, it's, you know, a template of disorganization and, and chaos that, you know, because I think we consider a lot abandonment wounds or rejection wounds, you know, quote unquote, 
but we don't actually really think a lot about enmeshment wounds or over, you know, being smothered or helicopter yes. parenting. I've had a conversation about parenting recently and I got a lot of messages being like, no matter what you do as parent, you can't. And I totally, we don't often consider that even being controlling and overwhelming as a parent wounds a child where they don't have space. And so they can become avoidant or having to take care of a parent's needs or an angry or a narcissistic parent, right? Like we're pivoting around their needs. And so we think someone else's needs comes with the loss of ourselves. So we're like, no, preserve self. You're too much, in which we, of course, hear that a lot. Exactly. So it's it's complicated. I do think that um, who a person chooses to be in a relationship matters. We're always going to face our trauma inside of, or even if we're with the right person, we're always going to be up against fear, our impulse to close our hearts and shut down the moment that we're afraid as opposed to being vulnerable. But, you know, there are some people who are just better matched for you, for one, than others. That's why I always say, like, if you're dating someone it's within the first month, two months, like really early, like that's the time to be really assertive and ask for your needs to be met. Because if your basic needs can't be met in month one, it's so tragic to me. And I see more women doing this, but men do this too, by the way, of just being like, well, I'm going to overlook that, or I'm going to try to earn their love. And it just becomes a mess so quickly. Who you choose matters. That the first few months of, of a relationship really matters. Like mm -hmm. you learn a lot. Mm -hmm. You learn a lot. If you're noticing that someone is just shutting down over like the littlest things, like you can really say like, this isn't my, I'm not being controlling. They're just like, I asked for a need to be met. And all of a sudden, you know, I don't hear from them for a couple of days. Yeah, that is a nightmare. Run far away from that. <laughs> Who needs that? You're right. Who needs that? But if you're just going to stay and try to earn their love, well, then guess what? You are part of the problem. You're part of the dynamic. You've got to work on you. What do you think was the largest or like some of the greatest learnings that you had when you immersed yourself in relational learnings? Like as soon as you discovered Tony and then you're like, oh man, okay. What were like some of the hugest light bulbs about relationship? So many because I, I'm one of those people who um, I spend a ton of money on my education. <laughs> <laughs> I am like, I have no problem asking people to invest in themselves because I've done it so much. So I have, had, I have a lot of mentors. There are a few huge revelations. Yeah. I'll list them. They're not necessarily in any particular order. One of the biggest revelations for me was diving, being exposed to David Dida's work, who is the who's the scholar on masculine and feminine energy. Now, I want to just say, again, I think that's part of it. I don't think it's everything. I also think that if you're going to learn about masculine, the energetics of the feminine, the masculine, really learn it from someone who has studied it and and studied it ideally with, with David Dida. Um, I'm heterosexual. I date men. So one of the things that was incredibly mind blowing for me was understanding the differences between men and women and being in a relationship with a man on a very general level, what men who date women really need that's different necessarily than what I need. So I felt very, also very validated because I would think, oh, there's something wrong with me for needing this. There's something wrong with me for being sad about this. There's something wrong with me for being, I must not be independent enough that I feel like a dagger is being put in my heart because every night when I come home from teaching class, he's busy, you know, because he had a huge job working and he doesn't even look up to greet me. Maybe there's, I would literally question that maybe I'm not independent enough, cool enough, strong enough. It's like, no, it was like, that's because that really just felt like a dagger in my heart. So hmm. understanding myself, understanding male psychology, which I really found fascinating. That was huge. What was also revelatory for me was that almost, and we'll just, let's just shelve extreme abuse. Let's just shelve that because I know that's that's a very sensitive topic and it should be shelved for what I'm about to say. But almost in every situation, there's two sides. Yeah, agreed. And that was revelatory because 
I had spent so much time blaming him or blaming myself and not enough time understanding that there was just two people involved in this and again, co-creating a dynamic that we didn't have the tools to be able to claw our ways out of. So those two things, really understanding my femininity and understanding my needs through the feminine lens, not just my individual needs, that was revelatory, understanding um, how then to communicate in such a way that um, sort of lands for someone that I could, that I would partner with. And then accountability. Also understanding like the things that we do when we're, when we're afraid, like our, our, our really dysfunctional, weird crap that we do. The stuff that comes out when the wound is like potentially most ready to be engaged. Oh, yeah. 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 I still find myself dysregulated sometimes in those states, you know, where I'm like, feeling overwhelmed or feeling a lump in my throat or trying to get words out and I have to practice all the practices. You know, you realize when, you know, you mentioned at the beginning, looking back and seeing where you were and now where you are, and I'm sure in 10 years, the same thing will happen. It, it, there's this level of um, like the work works, you know, when you do it, when you learn it. Uh, I'm curious, what did what did you learn about men and their needs in relationship because i'm sure for and, and for women that was uh, revelatory so what was revelatory and also because even though the the majority of the people i work with are women i actually do have a lot of male clients and i i always had a lot of men in my yoga classes because i think they really resonated with my style whatever you know i helped them with their stiff hamstrings <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so this is, this is sort of proven to me and this is whether they're, however they identify, um, as gay or straight or whatnot. But so what I learned, and you can verify this for me or push back is that <laughs> I never knew, I never knew how important it was to the person I'm in a relationship with for him to experience my peace and happiness mm. and that my constant struggle at the time with feeling stress and dealing with tension was both a turnoff and also a stress for him because then he thought I couldn't make her happy. Mm. And this is why so much of what I teach to me, my experience is that what destroys relationships faster than anything else and the most out of anything else is stress, how we are dealing with our stress. Because when we're stressed, we become obsessed with ourselves and getting our needs met. We become very tense. We're not as open to our partner we are um, closed off, even if we don't really mean to be closed off. I mean, stress is just that, it has that impact on us. Because one thing that, that I would complain about that a lot of women, when I say a lot, I'm talking thousands of women say, whether they're in a relationship with a man or a woman, but more specifically, if they're in a relationship with a man, is I'm not allowed to be in a bad mood. Mm. I'm not allowed to be cranky. It's so triggering to them. And what I learned is twofold. You know, what I have to teach the men who I work with is you're not responsible for her happiness, for their happiness. You're responsible for adding value to their lives, to trying to make them happier, to try to make their road, the path that they walk a little easier, but you're not responsible. And guess what? If you're in a relationship with a woman, she has a hormonal system that is that fluctuates a lot, even if she's postmenopausal. So less so if she's postmenopausal. But there's a lot of fluctuation there. So get used to it, buddy. You know, whoever's <laughs> dating her. Like yeah. there's she's gonna sometimes be in a bad mood. If you make her feel shame for being in a bad mood it's going to get worse. If you love her anyway, it's going to get better. But then what I teach women is 
why are you so stressed all the time? What's happening? Why are you unhappy all the time? Okay, let's shelve the hormonal stuff in the cycle. What's going on? Are you so disconnected from your joy that you are no longer bringing joy to the relationship? Now, I would say this to anyone, regardless of gender. We are so much more attractive when we are connected to our joy. We can't always be. Mm -hmm. Two people struggling in a relationship, almost always they're struggling individually to find joy within themselves. Almost always. It's like mathematical how wild it is. So what I learned about men is they feel very responsible for the persons that they're in a relationship with, with their happiness. And they think that if they're unhappy, that it's actually their fault. Mm, so true. For men, they have to learn that they're not responsible for the happiness, that they have to almost embrace the bad mood once in a while, not all the time, once in a while, and give her or him the freedom to go in and out of mood sometimes without feeling judged. Yeah, I remember my dad once saying to me, like, when your partner is upset, just ask if she needs anything. Do you need to fix it or just listen? And I was like, why didn't you tell me that when I was like 18? That would have saved me so many attempts to try to fix. Also, I definitely resonate, right? I resonate with that a lot in that, like just giving someone sovereign choice over what support they need in that moment, but not trying to save them from a feeling. You know, I think for me, that came back a lot to being the youngest in the family and wanting to like, I was really oscillating around my mom's emotional state. And so it just made sense that that sort of, if mom's safe, then I'm safe. Like if mom's not upset or stressed, then I'm okay. And I think that maybe that's true a lot for men. And I think one of the things that I notice a lot for men in relationship is that, I mean, you, maybe you could speak to the other side of this, is that they don't feel appreciated. Like there's not like an overt expression that's explicit. Like I'm so grateful for X, Y, Z. And I was asking Kai about that and she's like, I think that part of that is that in appreciating the masculine or the man for, let's say, providing or whatever it might be, there is a fear that we're actually not feminist enough or like we're potentially in the place where we've been taught to never be. And I was like, oh, that's really interesting. That gives so much more compassionate understanding mm -hmm. of why it's so hard to demonstrate appreciation. But that's something I definitely notice a lot for men that I know and, and speak to. It's huge. That was another revelation to be appreciated. And it's, yes, it could be in the form of a thank you, but to really feel that and not to be constantly focusing on what's missing and mm -hmm. complaining. And, you know, they're not doing enough for me. And that could be, you know, that woman could have been raised with a mom who basically told her, you can't trust men. Right. Never depend you on know, them, all that stuff. Never depend on a man or don't trust him or, you know, he's going to hurt you, even if she was indirect. And so all of a sudden they're not doing enough for me and they're going to hurt me. So I'm just not going to appreciate. So yeah, appreciation is so incredibly important for everyone, but for men in particular and for women to be understood. Women in relationship experience a lot of feeling misunderstood. And I think that that has to do with in general, women do have more, whether it's conditioned, whether it's biological, that's a separate conversation, but there's a richer emotional world. There's like a more, not it's not that it's deeper than a man's, it's just that there's more contact with, they're more in touch with all these various emotions and we're taught to repress them. Mm, yeah, so true. Not be too much, not be too emotional. Yeah, don't be too much. Don't be too emotional. Be rational. We're huge forces in the workforce now that we never were 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 years ago. And so in the workforce, you have to turn on a completely different part of yourself. Just wanting to be heard and understood is so important. And But, you know, we can't, I always say, like, love, being in a relationship means being okay with not really understanding someone all the time. <laughs> That's kind <laughs> I mean, of the mystery, you know, too, that yeah. there, there's always more. 
to learn and understand. I wish I hadn't known those skills, you know, younger, because I would have at least understood what my partners in the past needed. But I think I was so afraid of not being enough and then hearing how, what I needed to bring, not realizing that I'm getting the answer to, <laughs> to the riddle. You know, there's a funny meme I saw that it's like a man talking to a woman. And it's like, women are so mysterious. And the woman's like, well, if you so mysterious. And it's like, if you would just list the mystery. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> and I think it's so indicative of yes. like if, if we knew how to understand, we wouldn't be having the same conversations all the time. There wouldn't be the constant bidding for emotional connection because it would be rich in the times that it occurs. But we can be pretty complicated too as women. I mean, we're, we are- The manual's thicker, we do expect, for sure. Yeah, the manual's like, it's It's just sort of like, well, there's a lot of, if you're in a relationship with me, how come you can't read my mind? You know, how, <laughs> how come you don't know that when I'm pulling away, I actually want you to chase after me? I don't want, I don't actually want, you know, so <laughs> there's just, there's so much. <laughs> I mean, there's, you know, the amount of mixed messages that we give all the time unconsciously in a relationship is quite overwhelming. And I think that, you know, a large part of relationship healing is being able to be accountable for the mixed messages that we give all the time without even meaning to because our fear is getting in the way. Mm. But something you said really resonated with me because I'm the youngest too. And, you know, my father was incredibly emotionally dysregulated. And so, um, and also I was as a child, as a young child, very emotionally dysregulated to the point where my father wrote a best selling psychiatry book on me called The Difficult Child. <laughs> oh my God. And so yes, which is like he was on Oprah twice. So there's a there's a lot to the story there. <sighs> wow. But yes. So I look at then, you now. Look at me now. Seriously. <laughs> so um, but I learned how to suppress my emotions because I didn't want to be difficult. Mm. So, and then I didn't want anyone to get upset, sort of like what you did in your family. Like I wanted to make sure everyone was okay. And so if I got upset, th then I was difficult, then I was the focal point, and then I was the cause of everyone's emotional dysregulation. We come with a lot of stuff, all of us. It's like, it's kind of wild. We inherit a ton. I'm curious if we that inherit book- a ton. When it came out, were you conscious that it was about you? Yeah. So, I mean, this is like, wow. I'm writing about this now. So it's a, it's a huge thing, um, which I've come to some peace with with my father and whatnot, because he used my name, which he's apologized since. And so wow. people would be like, oh my God, you know, because at the time when it came out, it was in the eighties, it was, um, no, I, I, I knew that it was about me, but because I was so young, I was excited. I was like, I'm famous. <laughs> <laughs> There's a book about me. I'm significant. This is amazing. It's an interesting paradox to hold because it's like, it's about you being difficult, but then your difficulty is what has now given you some form of fame. This is part of the things that I teach with, and I know you teach a lot of heartbreak recovery, is that um, I've joked in the past with my ex-husband, like, he's been like, should I send you a bill? I'm like, yeah, maybe you should. <laughs> so if it weren't for you. <laughs> should I send you a bill? I feel that way about my exes, you know, just the best teachers. And at the time, yeah, I wasn't the best student. Um, I wasn't willing to be a student. It's almost in hindsight that they became, you know, these soulmates, you know, on so many levels. Yes. I am yes. um, curious too, in in his book, The Difficult Child, did he talk about the parent? I know it's so it's so interesting. The 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 gist of the difficult child is that basically the difficult child is just a highly sensitive child mm. who picks up on the dysfunction of the family. That's good, at least. Yes, it? definitely. But there's just like I think it's called something else, but like I didn't like the way certain fabrics felt on me. I didn't really have a circadian rhythm, but he was he wrote it for parents so that they don't feel like failures. Mm. and to help them help their quote unquote difficult child. But there was no, there was nothing in the book like, well, maybe your child is actually picking up on some of your shit. And that's part, so no, no, none of that. Uh, that's really the essence of it, isn't it too? It's yeah. like children, they figure it out and they figure it out. And yeah. it's not always functional ways of getting needs met. It's usually observed ways that the other parent does or another sibling. Yes. Or, Anything yes. to get some sort of need of connection. 
I mean, I feel like I could talk to you for hours about all this. I know, we really could. <laughs> That's a whole other conversation, but yeah. I'm so grateful for, I want to be mindful of your time here. I'm, we definitely, I, I we got to have another conversation because we could go on about many different subjects because I did want to touch on the lowering tolerance of BS as we, unfortunately, it usually comes as we age, you know, it's like the gift of our biolo- our biological clock is, it should be inversely correlated to our tolerance for bullshit, but it isn't. Absolutely. So we're going to have to break that down on the next one. Jillian, thank you so much for coming on and, and sharing your wisdom and your story and, and just all the things you've learned and your very calm state. Your voice is very soothing. Uh, I'm curious, where can people find more of you? Just Google my name, JillianTarecki.com, at Jillian Tarecki on Instagram, Jillian on Love on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever you listen to your podcasts. Uh, recently on TikTok, <laughs> so nice. that's a whole other conversation. Yeah. So yeah, basically, you know the spelling of my first and last name. You can find me in those those places. Awesome. Well, we'll make sure we link it all out in the show notes. Uh, thank you again for your time. Much appreciated. Thank you so much. 